Okay. So welcome everybody to the How We Heal series. Um, in previous panel discussions, we've, we've had a few different practitioners involved in sharing their opinions and experience and tools and strategies about key issues that have been coming up lately um, in their own practice, but also just generally in the world. We're, we're all going through a lot of different things, different experiences. Um, we, we focused on fear, self-care. Last week it was anxiety and depression. And this week uh, we're changing the format a little bit and going to be having a one-on-one -on -one interview with, um, with Tom Perrick. Tom Perrick is an addictions counselor. He has a background in mindfulness. Um, he's a psychotherapist and, um, and a teacher. So we're really happy, delighted to have Tom with us today to share his uh, background and experience um, on resilience. These discussions are meant to be uh, helpful, not just for, for you guys, but also um, for viewers post COVID. So the, the content that we're gonna be going to be exploring today, resilience is really quite timeless. We're certainly being challenged with it right now, but um, moving forward, um, we hope that the tools and strategies that are going to be shared today in this discussion will help many people for, um, for years to come. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Tom to introduce himself. Um, Tom, why don't you get started just explaining a little bit about your background and what brings you to this topic. And uh, yeah, I'm sure everybody's looking forward to, to meeting you. Sure, Marie, thank you. Uh... Welcome to everyone. So I've been working for almost two decades in the field of uh, mental health and addiction counseling and psychotherapy. I've worked at uh, big agencies and small agencies, uh, primarily with people who struggled with some kind of uh, addictive behavior. And these behaviors could relate to substance use, but also to a certain uh, repeated activities or actions that people continue doing despite experiencing negative consequences. Uh, I also teach at the college in the field of uh, social sciences primarily, courses in psychology, addictions, social and political thought as well. And I, I'm trying to uh, share my experiences as, as much as, as, as I can in many different ways. And I hope this one, the first, the first one in my life, will be one of those. Uh, when, when I saw uh, how Melanie uh, titled this talk, uh, Resilience in Crisis, I had a few interesting thoughts. I wa was not sure how to understand it completely. Excuse me for a second. So on the, on the first sight, it seemed to me that, probably with a good reason, that the title refers to this uh, moment we are living, this uh, kind of extraordinary, strange times uh, associated with COVID-19 crisis, right? So the, the question, uh, from this aspect would be how how do we stay resilient during this crisis so what what are we to do to minimize the negative impacts of whatever changes are happening around us and these changes are really kind of uh, 
uh, multifaceted. So at individual level, at family level, at uh, local, regional, country, even global level. So there are many, many changes and many unknowns that people find themselves in the need to somehow deal with. And so th that was one, one, one aspect of how I understood this uh, title of the talk, Re Resiliency in Crisis. But at the same time, uh, I, I saw a possibility of thinking of this differently. Uh, and, and that other way was to think about this crisis challenging our resilience skills. So making it more difficult for us to engage with life. So in this other sense, it's about the crisis of resilience. And I've already heard from some people that this is exactly what, what's, what, what's going on. So my idea is to somehow bring these two aspects uh, together and not neglect either one in talking about the essential uh, approaches uh, associated with this uh, complex term of uh, resilience. Thank you, Tom. Welcome. So, um, can, we, can we start then by just talking about what is resilience? Like, it's just so we're on, all yeah. on the same page. Like, what is it? What, what isn't it? Um, how, do we, how do we know we're being resilient? Yes, that's, that's certainly a good question. And uh, it's not easy to answer. And usually the questions are better than answers. And good questions are not only better than bad questions, but better than any answer, simply because good questions generate many possible answers so that people can kind of uh, decide for themselves or find out for themselves which answer uh, kind of uh, works for them, right? So that's, that's the uh, key kind of uh, beauty of a good question. So what does it mean? What is it? It's certainly one of the more popular concepts in psychology and one of the probably more loosely used concepts. There are so many different ways in which we can think about it. I'd like to start maybe with the probably simplest uh, provisionary definition. So let's, let's call it a, a working definition of uh, resilience. For me, it is simply uh, doing well in facing adversity. So doing well, the ability to do well despite some kind of crisis. It may sound very abstract, and many definitions are necessarily so, but I think this uh, simple definition captures some of the essential aspects to, uh, to uh, resilience. And what's for me very important to understand that uh, resiliency is comprised of uh, two major uh, kind of uh, dimensions or aspects. One is, and I think this is, this is the one that is commonly understood, that it's recovery, it's bouncing back to the old. So we have some kind of stress, some kind of challenge, uh, so some critical moment in our life. Uh, we, we become kind of shattered, for a while, and then we bounce back or 
recovery or, or we recover from whatever it is and go back to the old status quo, the old state of the mind, for example. That's certainly one of the uh, important aspects of resilience. But there's another one. And I think it's, it's even more important. And this is something that has to do with our ability to sustain continuing our life course in a way that is meaningful and satisfac satisfactory uh, for us. So it's not only recovery, but also discovery of some skills and energies that are helping us to continue leading the life that we want for ourselves. So, so taking, taking together these two dimensions, I think is, is a good, at least initial way to start thinking about uh, resilience. Thank you. I, I think that's really interesting, like that you that you frame it in terms of recovery and also discovery. Yes, um, you know, when you were talking, you talked about just that that ability to recover when we have a stressful event or um, some a challenge that shows up in life. One of the questions that we have uh, from Jacqueline and then another anonymous uh, participant today is about having been resilient for um, a long time or when there's multiple things that are that are kind of compressing and compressing I just have a truck going by one sec i'm sorry if that's um can you hear it yeah. um so you have multiple things going on in life over and over and your your resilience is being challenged over and over and it just feels like um you're at risk of burnout because there's just one thing after another, after another, after another. And how do you, um, uh, the one person um, who is anonymous, they're saying that um, that just they're just feeling really burnt out, and they're they're just so tired of being resilient. Like they're just like, really, I have to be resilient again. Like they just they're really exhausted. And then. Um, the other person, the way they had described it, it was about like just being faced with those continuous challenges. Do you have some feedback for people that are just feeling really bombarded and, and what does resilience look like when you're, when you're really under that much pressure? Mm -hmm. Well, that's another good question. Inviting probably different directions in answering it. And it's interesting term, uh, resiliency burnout. Uh, certainly there is such a possibility because uh, our energies are of course limited. We can, cannot count on unlimited source of energy, just going on indefinitely, right? So we need sometimes, and now I'm thinking about this uh, getting tired of resiliency, to take, take a pause, to rest. Actually, I think that it's not always necessary to put an effort into struggling with whatever is challenging us, at least not in a continuous way. Sometimes just stepping, stepping back, taking a pause, taking a rest, allowing ourselves to not react, to not even respond, to accept the difficulty of the, of the situation can bring us back in, into the inner source of energy, that resource that we have to continue later on 
using it in some form to deal with the, with the challenges. So even that feeling of getting tired or, or burning out can be accepted as, as a kind of a teaching of for, for stepping back. And by doing that, actually increasing our resilient skill for the, for the later time. Uh, there, there are many, there are many, many possible uh, strategies. Probably I, I, I will mention some, and I don't know if that's, that's the, the best moment to do it now, but uh, speaking generally of resiliency, there are some established in the science of psychology and other social sciences uh, principles that can help us develop resiliency as, as, as a skill. And these basic uh, principles of key components of resilience, we can summarize into four main ones. For example, one of them is what psychologists call the inner internal locus of control. So this is, this is the kind of uh, feeling that we are skillful, empowered enough to, to take care of, of uh, our life. So we kind of uh, rely on our ability to deal with uh, the situation as opposed to blaming the situation or blaming others. So we have this internal locus of control and that, that's a very kind of uh, well-developed concept that some people call, call hardiness, some people call grit, uh, and there are many, many, probably many other terms. Another key component of resilience is a sense of connectedness, sense of connection. So this feeling that we are connected to other people, to the world, to our own self as well, maybe to the divine as well. So this sense of, of not being alone and completely cut off from others and ourselves is important element of resilience. The third key uh, component or principle would be a sense of meaning and purpose. And this is one of those deeply philosophical questions that actually our life asks us. So our life asks us what we want to do with our life. What's the purpose of our life? What do we want? how to live and this uh, big existentially uh, crucial sense of meaning even if it's in looking for the meaning is an important uh, component of, of resilience and i think the the fourth key principle that we can talk about that is also well established in, in uh, research studies and self-reports of people is a sense of hope and optimism. So these positive expectations because without, without this hopefulness, 
it is very, almost impossible to motivate ourselves to continue. And for resiliency, as I mentioned before, that's that other aspect to it, to sustain, uh, to continue our life in a way that we would like it to unfold, right? So we need that kind of motivation that also our inspiration that, that is, is supported by having some sense of hope or optimistic outlook uh, at life. So if, if we keep in mind these four uh, major principles, uh, it's good to remind ourselves of them and of course find a way of how to uh, practice the skills that are related to these principles. It's one thing, uh, of course, to, to become intellectual aware of, of some uh, principles, some ideas, some concepts. But the other thing is to find a way how to practice them in our daily life. And that's, that's the real, real task and the real uh, challenge. But a hopeful message is that it's possible to do because these skills can be learned. Is there any, are there any resources um, that you could share at the end, Tom, um, to help people with some practices for each one of those four areas? Uh, internal locus control, connectedness, meaning and purpose and hope? Yeah, I, I have quite a lot, you know. Uh, <laughs> and <laughs> you know, the, the problem is, uh, uh, which one? Which ones to choose to to speak about? So I'd like to maybe uh, keep it for discussion that I hope to, okay. uh, you know, have along the way. Yeah, fair enough. But yeah. but maybe just just to start off, maybe I can offer some that actually I think uh, have worked in my own personal life. Okay, that would be great, thank you. Okay. Uh, maybe I should preface this that uh, as many of us, I also have had some uh, traumas, small T traumas that are kind of regular common developmental traumas. But, but also some, some big traumas, like uh, uh, big T traumas. And I think that we are kind of uh, facing these, these rather stronger, more intense traumas these days. And I can mention, for example, briefly, uh, a few things that have happened in my life that really, uh, Challenge, challenge me uh, to a significant degree, to probably a degree that brought me to the brink. First of all, I lost my father when I was about uh, 14 years old. And it was a quite, quite big change. I think everyone can imagine losing a par parent in those, those young years. Uh, another was uh, actually the experience of civil war in my country of origin, which is fortunately uh, something that Canada had been spared of for, for quite a long time. But in my country, uh, former Yugoslavia, uh, the civil war or brother killing war was one catas cataclysmic uh, social uh, event that certainly influenced many of our individual lives, including in my own. And by the way, it caused me to think about changing the country and deciding to come to Canada, which is another big trauma. So 
immigration by itself is a traumatic event because you need to relearn, readjust completely to a new world, new form of life. So it does take a lot of, lot of uh, energy as well. Then another big trauma was, uh, was uh, rather of personal relationship uh, nature. Uh, and it was the time when I felt uh, uh, losing very close people in my life, my family members, my very near family members for different reasons, which again uh, put me in, in, in a, uh, a severe predicament of how to continue after that. Because once, once you experience a thing like that, you, you start feeling uh, like, like one uh, lingering in the space, not knowing how and where to land. Because that proverbial rug was pulled out from, from under your feet. And also another big one was a physical challenge personal physical challenge, uh, the heart attack that I experienced some years ago. And of course, uh, uh, I should not mention job losses of different kinds that, again, just added to today's uh, big traumas. When I reflect on, on how I survived all of them and, con and continued living, increasingly, meaningfully and joyfully, I have to happily admit, I, I, I try to kind of uh, go back, of course, and, and, and see what, what, what was it that helped me. Of course, uh, I did not have many of the, uh, much of the awareness of consciousness at the time. Uh, these things that I'm going to mention are rather uh, things that I, I have seen in retrospect. So go looking, looking back. I can quickly uh, just uh, select a few. For example, uh, let me mention uh, this, first of all, this hope. For some reason, I always felt, not just understood, but felt in, 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 in my being that this, what is happening is impermanent. It changes, it will go away. So this hope was a skill that I somehow had that helped me deal with, with the challenges and, and the tasks that the life threw at me. Another, another uh, kind of skill was probably uh, this even unconscious understanding that there are some things that, that I can control and some things that I cannot. Probably in my readings in philosophy and literature, I also uh, gain an understanding of the tragic beauty of life. So life is, is great, it is beautiful, but at the same time tragic with a lot of pain and loss and suffering. But despite of all of that, it offers you a possibility to, again, continue and enjoy it while it lasts, right? And if I'm allowed, there is one little song that for some reason I have been saying to myself, even explicitly, since about uh, sometime in high school when I first encountered it. Uh, so, some of them some of the participants in, in this uh, discussion who, 
who happen to speak the same uh, first language as, as I will maybe remember of the poem called Slap. Slap. And if I'm allowed, it's very short. I'd like to read it in English uh, translation. Is it okay, Maya? Please do. Yeah. Okay. So it's called Waterfall. It flows and flows, flows the waterfall. Does my little drop make any difference at all? Look, a rainbow appears in it. And in a thousand colors, it appears shivering and lit. That dream lighted up in the waterfall and my drop helped to weave it all. So for me, this was extremely helpful reminder of how to look at life and myself in life. I'm just a little drop, right? But my little drop also helps this, this rainbow to shine in thousand colors. And I, I can tell you, maybe, maybe it's kind of weird, but this is the song that have been traveling with me forever since, since I first encountered it. Whenever I, I'm in doubt, feeling uncertain about uh, things and myself, I try to remember it. So I will encourage everyone to find some source in you know, good literature and poetry. And this is one of the strategies to kind of uh, take it for their own personal uh, inspiration that can help in, in difficult moments. That's a beautiful poem. Okay. And thank you so much for translating it for us all. Okay. I, I haven't translated it, but it, it was already translated. So I just read it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. You're welcome. Um, it's so hard to move on from that because it was yeah. your your story was so beautiful and uh, and that poem was was really really beautiful. A couple of our of our participants are struggling with dealing with their own negativity and also um, other people's negativity. So on the one hand, when somebody comes into a conversation and the person that they're speaking to is always on the defensive or always, you know, coming, coming uh, on as aggressive and how to respond to that in a resilient way. That was one aspect. And the other was the person feeling they themselves were, were always, they, they caught themselves. They know that they're supposed to be optimistic and, you know, there's like this way to look at things in a, in a more beautiful light, like your poem. Um, and they feel like their brain is just hardwired to, to to flip to the negative. So I'm just wondering from from both perspectives, like the person that's receiving that negativity, and how do they respond in a resilient way, and then also uh, the person that's experiencing the negativity within themselves, and how do they how do they go at it? Yes, uh, another good question. So maybe I can I can start with just mentioning that we do have a so-called negativity bias. Our brains are hardwired to react more intensely to negative experiences than to positive ones. Uh, there, there, there is a kind of good. Uh, uh, saying in, in, in the neuroscience and psychology that goes something like this. Uh, our, our mind is like a Velcro for negative experiences and like a Teflon for positive ones. So we tend to spend much more time uh, with negativity of some kind that we experience than with positive experiences. And the kind of uh, 
explanation for this coming from evolutionary uh, psychology is that we needed this in order to be able to survive. Because if we did not react immediately and strongly to the challenge of, you know, our life being pushed you know, to the moment of death by some predator, we could not survive. So those who survived, and we are speaking about millions of years of evolution here, are those people who reacted more intensely and remembered also more intensely the negative experiences, which prevented them from uh, actually being a victim of the danger. So we have this ingrained, we are hardwired to negativity. Uh, that's a great uh, uh, skill. It's a great uh, kind of uh, uh, great uh, re reactive pattern to have in, in times of danger, of course. But we are not living anymore among, well, most of, uh, most of us among immediate dangerous circumstances. Although with the COVID, things are changing, right? Or the perception of, of the risk is, is being heightened. But in these more normal uh, conditions, this kind of negati negativity bias of the mind can be detrimental actually to, to living well and being at peace. So what do we do about it? Well, uh, first of all, we, we have to understand this bias. We have to uh, accept that it is so, but also to understand that it does not have to have all the time the upper hand, that we are able to shift away from it by practicing some skills. And there are, for example, kinds of uh, approaches in, in uh, psychotherapy, particularly the one developed by a neuroscientist and psychologist, Rick Hansen, uh, that is based on actually developing these positivity skills, these strengths, qualities of our being and mind that can counterbalance or put into perspective whatever negativity we tend to experience. Uh, Is that like the um, positive psychology website that you're referring, like that, that branch of psychology? Yeah, it's, it's coming, uh, loosely speaking, uh, it's coming from, from this shift in psychology called positive psychology that is focusing more on health and strengths as opposed to illness and weaknesses that the old uh, form of psychology tended to focus more on, right? Mm -hmm. So here we are primarily concerned about what are those qualities that we want and skills that we want to strengthen in ourselves in order to uh, live well. Mm -hmm. And another, another important concept here is the, the concept of psychological flexibility. For example, th these are skills that are quite well developed in the acceptance and commitment uh, therapy uh, of diffusion, acceptance, presence, self, values, commitment to action. That's a whole program of how we can work on kind of developing these uh, skills that liberate us from being just, you know, the victims of our own negative minds and of, of our experiences. And I can, I can mention uh, 
maybe a little bit later, a few of them. Okay. As a, strat as a strategy. Yeah, thank you very much. That's really helpful. And I, I know there's there's a, a couple folks um, that had asked uh, more general questions around what are some things that I can do in my daily practice to, to encourage resilience. And I, I my impression from a lot of your answers is that you've given a number of strategies that uh, can be used every day. And that some of the these these resources, whether it's websites or uh, systems of thought can give give folks some practices. I think this would be a really good blog article as well, Tom, um, just to yeah, sure. write yeah. more further, further on. Um, yeah, we, we, we can include certainly some of these resources and more kind of detailed mm -hmm. uh, links. Yeah, I think that would be really helpful, yeah. for sure. Um, yeah. one, one participant um, asked a question here specifically around procrastination, like knowing um, that going to the gym is good for them and knowing that um, doing healthy things is good for them, but they, um, they, you know, I'll do that tomorrow and then tomorrow comes and then it's going to happen again the next day. So um, do you have any suggestions for, for procrastinators out there? Uh, yes, th that would be probably a good uh, suggest suggestion. Uh, to myself to practice more of these skills because I, I have to admit I, I struggle with this as well. So one, 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 one way I think would be to approach it in a kind of stepped way. Uh, starting with this. So when, when we uh, feel this command, directive, coming from one part of our mind to postpone our task at hand that we need to work on, because there is some kind of deadline, for example. So when we kind of uh, become aware of this thought, just to stop for a moment and really observe it. Really let it say what it's saying. And usually it says things like this, okay, don't bother, don't, you know, work on, on, on this now, uh, leave it for later. There are more things to do now than this, whatever it is, right? So there are many ways in which our funny part of the mind is trying to pull us away from a task at hand, right? So when we notice that, just to really stay with it, okay, and say to ourselves, oh, look, look at this thought, it's happening again. So this guy, you can call, you can give this part of your mind a name. Because you are kind of increasing the uh, distancing. You're ex extrapolating this part of yourself and you are facing it. Oh, look at him. He's again telling me to procrastinate. Oh, how interesting. And also at the same time, when we are allowing ourselves to experience this thought, to pay attention to the feelings that are associated with that moment. There may, there may be some moment of, you know, impatience, some, some feeling of uh, a desire to run away because procrastination is a form of uh, experiential emotional avoidance. We procrastinate because we want to avoid dealing with the stress of doing the work. So first step is to kind of really em embrace these thoughts and feelings allowing them to become clear and visible 
and 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 kind of uh, uh, there. So you're you're not pushing them away. You're not uh, running anywhere. You're just letting them be. And then, of course, you diffuse yourself from them. You dis uh, kind of dissociate yourself from them. And then you remind yourself of what actually important value there is in what you, you need to do. So is there any value that is confirming uh, your self-directed uh, movement, right? You, you kind of, uh, what is it in, in what you need to do that is confirming what is of value in how you live your life? And uh, eventually, if you practice these, these steps, you, you might be able to uh, recognize these, ide these procrastinating ideas and desires and deal with them uh, more skillfully than, than before. Maybe this, this is one way to deal, deal with it that I'm trying to use it myself as well. That's really helpful. So like really just slowing down, taking a step back yeah. and having a dialogue with yes. the emotions that are exactly. under you. Just, just stopping, pausing, slowing down, just yeah. letting, letting these to come up, not yeah. running away from them. Right. Letting them stay for a while, see what it is that they really lead mm -hmm. to. Yeah. Is it what you really want? And, and then move away from that. Hmm, thank you. So we were able to get through our questions for today. Um, I don't see any additional ones in the chat box. So if we could take the last few minutes of our call today to share some resources. How has resilience been for you guys? Is there anything that has helped you out in your life? Any resources, strategies, techniques that you can share with uh, the participants? You can just unmute yourself if you'd like to, to talk and, uh, and share. Yeah, that, that would be great to hear. I, I'm very curious <laughs> what people are doing. For me, um, one of the things that has helped me a lot um, has been to really monitor my expectations. And um, sometimes my disappointments are one of my worst enemies. Um, I am a, a fairly perpetual yeah. optimist and I get let down by my own expectations a lot. So I, um, mm -hmm. in life, whether it's family or or friends or community teachers, people that I've looked up to, um, just really hoping and feeling that they're gonna give the best that they can or that they're gonna be there for me in a certain way and then they're not. And um, having to be resilient about that meant going elsewhere to get the support that I needed from, from places that um, maybe I didn't expect right off the bat. So not expecting a specific family member to behave in a certain way. And if I don't get that need from that person, then I'm um, at the loss. Mm -hmm. um, rather going and finding, finding that support, um, whether it's somebody to talk to or a place to be safe or a, a place to laugh and not, not expecting um, those things to come from um, from people just being really grateful when they do come. Mm -hmm. that is great. Um, the other, the other thing that has really helped me a lot, and uh, it might, I, for me, it has really helped with I think all of the four categories that you shared about about resilience, uh, Tom earlier. But prayer has been um, my relationship with spirit has been a huge guiding force when I felt the most alone and the most um, 
at at loss uh, the most hopeless um, my my belief in um, it actually wasn't just belief but actually feeling guided like I would I would have a prayer and then I'd go for a walk and somehow the universe would just line just what I needed up right before me and it might come from a complete stranger but again it, it's that it's that realizing that I'm cared for by something larger than myself or this unknown kind of quality or characteristic in the universe that's um, supporting and guiding me and turning, turning the biggest struggles into lessons. Um, and they actually ended up all being quite, I've never had a lesson that I haven't been able to use later. <laughs> so I, all these right now, I'm like, wow, I must really need a lot of lessons right now. <laughs> Yes, yes. Yeah. For whatever we're coming into as a society or as a community or as a family, as a citizen, um, all the skills that I'm using right now, all the challenges, um, I'm thinking they're going to be useful later. So I'm trying to yeah. approach it from this, like... For sure. You know, this, yes. You know, this, <laughs> this crisis is uh, these extraordinary times we're living. Uh, are really a combination of what the Chinese characters for the term crisis uh, uh, point to. One is uh, kind of uh, danger and the other is opportunity. And they come together in the crisis. Mm -hmm. So we have that uh, really uh, need to deal with the risks and dangers of life, but also an opportunity to reconnect with the most inner sense of self connected to others and the world that is continuously uh, regenerating this uh, motivation, inspiration, will, joy of living. Yeah, yeah. I just see that Jem, um, she shared something with everybody here about coping. She said, I've been writing and finding poetry that can serve as scripture, just as that waterfall poem. My favorite finisher, my favorites, finisher by David White and Start Close by, by him as well. Thank you, Jem. I'll, um, I'll look them up and I'll share them with everybody. And um, I'll also share the poem that you, that you shared as well, Tom, if you don't mind, in the, in the follow-up email. Not at all. Beautiful. So we are at time and um, I really value everybody's, um, the time that you've taken to be a part of the call today. Um, I do want to point out um, Tom's going to be participating in another panel discussion series on joy and meaning, um, joy and purpose. And that one, finding, what was it? Finding meaning and purpose? something like that oh uh, yes yes it's, it's i think in like a couple weeks so I'll, I'll send that information out as well um so you can you can continue this this dialogue there and we also have another panel discussion specific to pro procrastination um coming up in a in a couple months as well so these these discussions i've gotten some really um great feedback we've gotten feedback that has helped everybody um helped us improve the process and the length of time and the how we receive questions and respond to questions. So I just want to thank everybody who I see some familiar faces. I want to thank you for your feedback leading up to now on the previous discussions for helping us make the How We Heal series as, as good as it is. And um, please, in the follow-up email, I'm going to be asking for your feedback as well again. So if you do have some feedback about how we can improve and how we can, um, what you liked, what you'd like to continue, I'd really um, appreciate that. So just thank you everybody for- um, uh, Melanie? Yes. Can I, can I also add something? Of course. So, so uh, I, and it's a, it's a strategy as well. So I, I would like uh, to kind of uh, ask people, invite people, to tur turn off uh, after, our, after our conversation, any, any of these devices that they are using and step from the 
two-dimensional world into the three-dimensional world. So in, in the real rea reality and connect there with the uh, real reality. And also, of course, probably most uh, crucially, don't forget to, to love the one you're with. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. So I'm just going to stop our recording for today. And um, thank you very much, everybody, for, for being a part of this. Uh, if you need to reach out to Tom, you can reach him at tomparrotcounseling.com. And uh, definitely, if you have any further questions, um, you know, we're, we're here to help you and support you in any way we can. So on behalf of all of us at the Inner Arts Collective, thank you very much for participating today. I know your time is precious. Um, so keep safe. Thank you. Many blessings. All the best.